Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing Huntington's disease and Huntington's disease medications. Okay, right, so we're just in the process of discussing the genetics of Huntington's disease. Okay, so we've discussed that Huntington's disease results from problems with this protein known as Huntington. Okay, so the protein called Huntington has what's known as a polyglutamine tract, which contains this repeat of the amino acid glutamine. Okay, now if the Huntington protein uh, contains between 6 and 35 glutamines, then that's perfectly fine, that's perfectly normal. Okay, there's no problem with that Huntington protein. If it contains between 36 and 39, then it may well cause you to get Huntington's disease, or certainly at a risk of getting Huntington's disease. Okay, if on the other hand, you have within your cells uh, a Huntington protein with greater than 40 repeats of glutamine in this polyglutamine tract, you are guaranteed to get Huntington's disease within your life. And it generally begins uh, in the fourth or fifth decade of life. Okay, right. Now, uh, we've discussed that these glutamines have to have been coded for by some trinucleotide that was within the genetic code of the mRNA here, and therefore was also mirrored in a trinucleotide repeat in the DNA as well. Okay, now the repeat that you have in the mRNA then is the repeat CAG, cytosine, adenine, guanine, and this codes for the amino acid glutamine. Okay, so once again I'll repeat, if you have um, six to 35 of these trinucleotide repeats, then that's perfectly normal. That's not going to result in a Huntington protein that is at 40. If you've got 36 to 39, then you're at risk of getting problems there. But if you've got greater than 40 of these trinucleotide repeats, then you are going to produce a Huntington protein that's going to be faulty. Okay, now, we want to discuss the fact that there are no sporadic cases of Huntington's disease, okay? All Huntington's disease is present in the zygote, basically. Okay, so let's illustrate it, this. Let's show the two chromosome 4s here. So these two lines will represent chromosome 4s. Okay, now, I will represent a healthy Huntington's disease gene, i.e. one that doesn't have a too long trinucleotide repeat, where the trinucleotide repeat is between 6 and 35, and therefore isn't going to produce Huntington proteins that are dangerous, okay, by a blue dot there. And then, in fact, I'll make it more obvious. I'll colour the entire chromosome in in blue to mean that that uh, chromosome 4 does not contain a Huntington's disease gene uh, with uh, a dangerous number of trinucleotide repeats of CAG. Whereas I'll show this one here in orange, which shows that that chromosome is one that does contain a dangerous number, uh, well, it has a Huntington's disease gene, which has a dangerous number of these trinucleotide repeats within it. Okay, so greater than 40. Okay, now, if this is the case, then the person that this fertilized egg goes on to form will get Huntington's disease, okay? So you have to have had the mutation in the zygote, basically. It had to have been present in one of the chromosome 4s uh, within the zygote, basically. And then all of the cells of the body will have the same mutation, okay? You can't get Huntington's disease like this. Okay, so let me show the other case. You can't have this. You can't have both chromosome 4s in the zygote having uh, Huntington disease genes that are both healthy, so both blue chromosomes there, okay, and then this will grow up to produce a person which has cells uh, which all have you know, the same chromosome 4s as we had here originally, and therefore all of them have got normal Huntington's disease genes, okay, not dangerous, and then you can't have one cell in this um, person here getting a mutation in one of its Huntington's disease genes, which then causes the expansion of the uh, polyglutamine tract of that Huntington protein, okay, or the expansion of the trinucleotide repeat uh, within the gene for that protein, and then that person getting Huntington's disease. That just doesn't occur. You have to have this mutation present in a huge number of cells, and for that to occur, it had to have been in the zygote here. 
Okay, right. So that's what I mean by no sporadic cases of Huntington's disease. Okay. If someone is going to get Huntington's disease, you can look at the zygote uh, of that person uh, years before and they've ever developed, and you can say that they will get Huntington's disease, okay? If you look at the zygote and they don't have any problems, then you can say they're not going to get Huntington's disease. There's no sporadic cases of it, basically. Okay, now, that doesn't mean that you have to... Uh, sorry, that doesn't mean that if you're going to get Huntington's disease, one of your parents had to have Huntington's disease, and I want to explain that now. You might think, but surely that does mean that to get Huntington's disease, one of your parents had to have Huntington's disease, because these chromosomes, one has come from your mother and one has come from your father, okay? So, you know, that one of your parents must have had the uh, faulty Huntington's disease gene as well, and therefore they must have had Huntington's disease. Okay, but that's not necessarily the case, and I want to explain that now. So, let me get another piece of paper here. So basically, let's say that your father and your mother were both healthy, okay? They did not have Huntington's disease. So let's say this is your mother's uh, two chromosome 4s here, and let's say these are your father's two chromosome 4s here, okay? And let's say both of them have healthy Huntington's disease genes, okay? So Huntington's disease genes which do not have too many trinucleotide repeats within them, okay? And therefore do not go for Huntington proteins that are going to cause a problem, okay? Now, when they make gametes, especially when the father makes gametes, when he makes sperm, there is a risk, okay? There is a risk that the trinucleotide repeat uh, within the Huntington's disease gene is going to end up expanding, okay? So in spermatogenesis, the process of creating sperm, what can happen is the trinucleotide repeat can end up getting expanded, okay? So if I draw the sperm here, okay, here's the body of the sperm, and then in the nucleus, inside the sperm, you're only going to have one copy of chromosome 4, okay? Uh, remember, sperm are haploid, and also egg cells are haploid as well. And now, let's say that what's happened here in the formation of this sperm, the trinucleotide repeat has ended up expanding. Now, the mechanisms by which you get expansion are still not understood particularly well. Okay, but it is known that what can happen in spermatogenesis is there is this risk that that trinucleotide repeat, it was in a healthy range in the father here, but in the spermatogenesis it can get expanded, which means that the sperm now has a dangerously long trinucleotide repeat within its Huntington's disease gene, and it's only going to have one of these. Okay, then, when this is, if this sperm with this bad Huntington's disease gene here, happens to fertilize the egg cell, which let's say has got a healthy Huntington's disease gene here, then of course the fertilized zygote will then get uh, one uh, chromosome 4 which has a healthy Huntington's disease gene on, and the other chromosome 4 which has a bad Huntington's disease gene on. And of course you only need one bad Huntington's disease gene in order to get Huntington's disease. You only need one gene that is producing a Huntington protein with uh, greater than 40 of those glutamines in the polyglutamine tract to get Huntington's disease. So now this will develop into a person who will get Huntington's disease. Okay, so you can get Huntington's disease even though neither of your parents had Huntington's disease. However, this is not called sporadic Huntington's disease, okay? This is just new emergence of Huntington's disease, okay? Sporadic Huntington's disease would imply that you can look at the zygote and it's got perfectly fine um, genes then, okay, perfectly fine Huntington's disease uh, genes as a zygote, and then the person goes on to develop uh, Huntington's disease. That would be sporadic, okay, and we have not found anyone in which that has occurred, basically. Okay, so, um, that's a little bit on the genetics then of Huntington's disease. What I now want to talk about then is why. Why does having a Huntington protein with this uh, polyglutamine tract uh, of length greater than 40 
cause Huntington's disease? Why does that cause neurodegeneration? Okay, well, basically, Huntington proteins, which have got uh, a polyglutamine tract of greater than 40 um, residues, misfold, okay? And by the way, the abbreviation for Huntington is HTT like this. Often people do put capital H and then lowercase t, lowercase t. Some people will put them all as capitals, HTT like so, okay? But they're both short for Huntington protein. Okay, right. Uh, so, let's draw the Huntington protein misfolding then. So, Firstly, here is our Huntington protein here, and let's say its polyglutamine tract is now greater than 40 residues here. Okay, so this is this polyglutamine tract here after the N17 region. So I'll just label it up as the poly-Q region. Okay, what's then going to happen is this uh, bad Huntington protein here is now going to misfold. Okay, so I'll draw this like so. Okay, just something bizarre shaped like that. Okay, so this now is our Huntington protein that has misfolded in this strange shape here. Okay, and now once you've got this misfolded protein, what it's going to do is it's going to aggregate together. Okay, now there are speculated to be two different ways that it can aggregate together. Okay, one, it can just aggregate into amorphous aggregates. And this is basically just when loads of the Huntington proteins that are misfolded are just going to stick together like so in just a great blob. And the fancy way to say a great blob like so is to call it an amorphous, which means it doesn't have any sort of distinguishable shape. Okay, and then it's an aggregation, so an amorphous aggregate. Okay, so each one of those circles represents a misfolded Huntington protein. Okay, so here they all are, aggregated together to form this amorphous aggregate. And of course, the Huntington protein is in the cytoplasm, so this will be occurring within the cytoplasm. Okay, and you can also actually get it occurring in the nucleus as well. You can get these amorphous aggregates forming in the nucleus as well. Okay, so uh, the other way that Huntington proteins can aggregate together is they can form fibrils. Okay, so what's a fibril? A fibril is a really thin fiber. Okay, so here are multiple Huntington proteins aggregating to form a fibril here. Okay, so this is called a fibril. And now what can happen is you can end up sticking fibrils onto amorphous aggregates, and this produces you the full inclusion, okay, which I'll draw in a moment. So this is a fibril here. Okay, and then you can end up with the fibrils stuck to the amorphous aggregates and they make something truly hideous. Okay, so they're going to make something that will look like this. So here is the amorphous aggregate and then it will also have fibrils sticking off from the side of it like so. So here's one fibril, here's another fibril radiating out from the amorphous aggregate at the centre here. Okay, and then we've got another one coming off here. So let's colour it all in. So every single one of these uh, circles that I'm drawing here and colouring in turquoise is a misfolded uh, Huntington protein that's misfolded because it's got a too long polyglutamine tract and then it's aggregating in this bizarre way. Okay, so this structure then with the amorphous aggregate at the centre, oops, sorry, I didn't realise that was out of sight, okay, this structure then with the amorphous aggregate at the centre and the fibrils radiating out, this then is called an inclusion, okay, and you're going to find them within the nuclei of cells, you'll find nuclear inclusions, okay, and you'll also find cytoplasmic inclusions. Now, what is interesting is that even though the Huntington proteins are expressed all over the body, in cells all over the body, okay, and if you have one of these mutant Huntington proteins that has the too high um, level of glutamines in that polyglutamine tract, surely it should be aggregating all over the body. However, for some reason, it does not aggregate all over the body. This happens selectively within neurons, okay? So within neurons, you start getting cytoplasmic inclusions and nuclear inclusions. So let's draw this. So let's draw a neuron here. Okay, so the, here are the dendrites of the neuron. 
here is the axon ending with the axon terminal here okay and here is the cell body here with the nucleus okay and you end up getting these inclusions which I'll just draw as blobs with the fibrils radiating out you get them in the uh, cytoplasm and you also get them within the nucleus here okay but you selectively get them in neurons basically okay and then um, well firstly we don't know why it's selective for neurons why it doesn't occur in all cells okay the second mystery is we don't know why this actually kills the neuron okay it's obvious that it's going to cause some major disturbance but we don't actually know the mechanism by which it leads to death within the neurons but we are pretty confident that it does cause death within the neurons so having these um, inclusions like this seems to disturb the neurons enough that it causes uh, death of the neurons. Okay, so that then is uh, what is understood of the biochemical process underlying uh, the neurodegeneration that is seen within Huntington's disease. In the next video, what we will do is we will move on to looking at which areas of the brain are particularly affected by Huntington's disease, okay? And then we'll start to piece this together uh, as to how this uh, fits with the symptoms that are going to be seen in Huntington's disease.